to the book of Titus tonight, or the letter that Paul wrote to Titus. The book of Titus tonight that the Holy Spirit of God led Paul to write to Titus, used for instruction in church business for the past 2,000 years. Titus in chapter number one and let's let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again I just thank you for the privilege of meeting together tonight in your name. Lord, I just ask you to take over our time together. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Empty me of self. Lord, I just pray that uh, you'll uh, just uh, use me as your mouthpiece tonight. Speak to each and every one of us through your word. Help us to glean everything that we can from this uh, book of Titus tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The author of the book of Titus, I mentioned this morning, is the Apostle Paul. He's writing to a young pastor named Titus. Titus was a Gentile Greek. He was a convert of Paul, according to verse number 4. It says, uh, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith. And so, he was a convert of Paul. Uh, he was one of Paul's most trusted companions. He is mentioned 13 times in Paul's letters. Uh, Some believe, some scholars believe, he may have even been the brother of Luke, quite possibly. And so that would be interesting to find out. Uh, Titus first appears in the account uh, uh, when he accompanied Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem where he was a test case concerning Gentiles and the freedom of the law. That's according to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul was showing him off, basically, uh, to the Jerusalem church. He was showing the Jerusalem church that uh, there were Gentiles being converted and that they weren't, uh, that they weren't uh, basically, they didn't have to keep the law. They didn't have to be circumcised and things of that nature. And so uh, the Jerusalem church uh, was being shown that Titus was that person. Um, on Paul's third missionary journey, Titus is sent by Paul to Corinth to straighten out certain disorders in that church. Uh, he then met Paul in Macedonia and was sent back to Corinth carrying the uh, letter 2 Corinthians, the one we call 2 Corinthians. Titus carried that original letter to the church at Corinth. He is last mentioned in 2 Timothy 4.10, at which time Paul sends him from southern Greece to Dalmatia. Of course, you know where that's at. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a bunch of spots, spotted dog, uh, Dalmatians. You know. uh, we, uh, I, I, believe, I believe it's present day what we would call Yugoslavia. So he was sending them into, uh, basically into Asia, uh, kind of in the Russian area there. And so... Uh, that's the last mention of Titus, was Paul was sending him there. In this epistle, Titus is pastoring on the island of Crete, which is off uh, the southeastern coast of, of, of Greece. Um, the island of Crete is about, a, I'm reading my stats here, 150 miles long, 35 miles wide. Okay. How far is 150 miles? I'm trying to put this in perspective for you. To Hugo from here, well, Ida Bell to Hugo, I think it's 47. A toko would be 150 miles? It'd be basically Texarkana round trip. A little bit more. So, hey, bring, it, bring me that. Come on. Sit down. Thank you, sir. Uh, 150 miles. I know Durant takes about two hours to get to Durant from here. Uh, in, in Texas terms, mm-hmm. Sherman. Dallas, from, from our place, around Dallas. Yeah, yeah that'd be around Dallas. Yeah, yeah. 150. So that's a that was the the stra- That was how long this island was, being 35 miles wide. So decent size. I mean, I wonder how wide Rhode Island is. <laughs> But it's not, I mean, it's not a very big island when you compare it to Texas. But a lot of things are not very big when you compare it to Texas. Uh, but uh, 
It was 150 miles long, 35 miles wide. Uh, it's the largest of the Mediterranean uh, islands. It had 100 cities, many mountains and fertile valleys. Uh, the highest mountain, Mount Ida, was the traditional birthplace of the Greek god Zeus. That's what people, that's what the Greeks believed. That they believe that's where he was born. Uh, the Cretans, and this, and, and Paul mentions this uh, in chapter 1, the Cretans were relative, well, they were relatives of the Philistines, but they had a no notorious reputation of being always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. In other words, lazy gluttons. They were gluttons and they were lazy. And the Cretans were known for that by their own people. He was quoting one of their own people when he said that. He was quoting one of their own poets. A guy by the name of uh, Epimenides, if, I, if I'm saying that right. Hold on, I've got to go further in my notes. Come on, can't even get there. Uh, yeah, Epimenides, yeah. Uh, he was, uh, uh, he was a, a poet, and uh, he, he said of his own people uh, that they are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. This, uh, it, it, okay, I'm getting. The origin of this church there is unknown. We don't know where it, where it started. We don't know who started it. But it may have been started by the same uh, returning Cretans uh, who were present at Pentecost. See, what you what you got to realize about Pentecost in the book of Acts, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there was a lot of people there from a lot of different nations, which is what the miracle was. See, this is where today's tongues is not biblical tongues. Because today's tongues is not understood at all. When people talk in it, you can't understand what they're saying, and then they're supposed to have an interpreter who interprets for them. Correct? That's biblical tongues. That's what... Okay, so the miracle at Pentecost was everybody understood. The exact opposite of what we see today. The miracle was that everyone understood in their own language because you had people speaking Greek, you had speak, people speaking uh, Italian, you had people speaking uh, Yugoslavian, you know, <laughs> you had people speaking all kinds of stuff. Ethiopian, uh, the Ethiop there were probably Ethiopian Jews there, they were, they were all there, and they all heard the gospel in their own language. See, it'd be like me, it'd be like uh, uh, Brother Benito. Uh, not knowing English, only knowing Spanish. Okay, Miss Risa has never learned English. She only knows knows Choctaw. Uh, Brother Richard only knows Irish, and he can barely understand my English. I'm just, <laughs> no German. He only speaks German. That's all. He he doesn't know English. Okay, all right. And Sonny speaks New Yorker. <laughs> And so he doesn't speak English either. And uh, so, you know, let, let's just pretend that for just a second. And I'm up here preaching. The miracle of the tongues would be you're understanding everything I'm saying. And I'm speaking English. Because I'm normal. No. <laughs> I'm, I, uh, Carol's an Irish last name. So I'm, I'm speaking, uh, oi, me Irish spring. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, that's all I know. I have to quote the Irish spring commercial. Uh... And that's, that's all I know of. Uh, that's all I can do in Irish. But um, So I'm speaking to you. In, in Peter's case, it would have been in, in, I don't know if he was speaking Hebrew or Aramaic, but he's speaking one language, and the miracle was everybody understood it. So they believe that's possibly where this church started. Because what happened, a bunch of people got saved, and then they went home. Their home may have been on the island of Crete. It may have been in Dalmatia. It may have been in Ethiopia. The Ethiopian eunuch went home. Okay? And then they converted people there. They told them about the Messiah. And so people started getting saved. That's why Paul was writing the church at Rome. He had never even been there. A church started and he had never even been there. So it probably happened at Pentecost. That would be a good guess because a lot of people got saved right there and went home and started churches. Started telling people about Jesus. Started telling people about their salvation. And so that, that was the spreading of the gospel. And isn't that neat to think about? That the Lord wasn't just using Paul. 
Paul, what I would have to say, was probably his main instrument as far as missionizing the, the Gentiles, but he wasn't the only one. And I just think that's um, uh, amazing. And so Titus has gone and now he's pastoring this church on the island of Crete. Uh, Titus is facing the formidable task of setting in order the existing churches at Crete. Qualified spiritual leaders must be appointed and all age and gender groups must be instructed on their duties as Christians. He's got he's to lay it out. It's, it's going to be very similar to 1 Timothy where they're trying to set things in order in the churches. Uh, the problem of immorality at Crete makes it important for Titus to teach the importance of righteousness. False teachers make the establishment of sound doctrine also essential. There were uh, false teachers were popping up quite a bit. Titus is a conduct manual for church living. It was written between the years of 62 and 63 A.D. To put the uh, first Timothy was probably written around 61. Second Timothy, uh, it seems, was written right around the uh, year 67. So there's about a five, six year period there where he writes these three letters, okay, these three pastoral epistles. Titus was written, uh, I just said that, between Paul's first and second Rome, Rome, well, between Paul's first and second Roman imprisonments just after the writing of 1 Timothy. Paul wrote Titus from Corinth or Asia Minor. Paul planned to winter in Nicopolis, which is western Greece, and wanted Titus to join him there. Uh, Titus is the second of Paul's three pastoral epistles. Chapter 1 of Titus deals with the role of pastors in the church. Chapters 2 and 3 deal with the roles of the members in the church. And let's jump into this. Chapter number 1 and verse number 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. Paul calls himself a servant of God. And here in just a second, he is going to start explaining the roles, basically what's expected of a bishop, okay, what's expected of a pastor. And he's leading off this letter by saying, I'm a servant, first of all. I'm a servant. That, didn't I say that's the definition of a minister? To serve? Okay. He says, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to lead by example. I'm a servant. Uh, uh, that's, that's the first thing that a minister is to be, is to be a servant. Paul is describing here who he is and who these pastors should be. The Greek word for servant here means bond slave. That's what, that's what it really means. It means you're bound to your master, and, and you don't have any rights. You belong to someone. Bond slave, Paul calls himself that. Paul says, a, uh, he says, Paul, a bond slave of God. And so he's setting the stage here uh, for, for how pastor, you know, as a pastor, um, and I, I talk to Robbie about this a lot when we're traveling together. I tell him, you know, it's very important that we that we keep ourselves humble because um, we've we've got a little bit of power, and with power comes comes responsibility, and and you've got to keep yourself humble. You can't knowledge puffeth up. Pastors are supposed to be growing in their knowledge, and so it's always very important uh, for for any man in leadership, any woman in leadership but a pastor to humble themselves and stay that way. And, and keep in mind, I'm a servant of God. I'm a bond slave of God. That's what I am. That's what every Christian is supposed to be. But the, the pastor has to lead in that role. Okay, He has to try to show that. Uh, a bond slave is, fully, is supposed to be fully surrendered to the will of the Father. Uh, he's also supposed to be a preacher of the Word. Look at verse number 3. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. A pastor is supposed to be a preacher of the word. Uh, he's supposed to be a, 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 a spiritual parent of sorts. Look at verse 4. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith. So that's, those are kind of the roles of a pastor. Now he's going to go about uh, establishing 
basically, uh, he's going to tell Titus why he was sent there. Look at verse 5. For this cause, for this cause, left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. So if you're wondering why Paul sent uh, Titus there, you don't have to wonder. He tells us, For this cause I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are wanting or the things that are lacking, the things that are kind of out of order, set them in order, and ordain elders or pastors in every city as I had appointed thee. And then he goes into the same thing he told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3. If any, be, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Not accused of riot or unruly, young children. You hear me? Uh, this is why during school hours, I will every once in a while pop in and say, Miss Sophie, how are the kids doing? Are they treating you right? And Miss Sophie will say, no, they've got two strikes against every one of them. <laughs> if they get three strikes, they, don't, they, they get a punishment for the day from Miss Sophie. But we have told them if they get one strike, they get a punishment from Mom and Dad. <laughs> and so they've been real good about, especially Thessalon, has been real good about coming and telling us, I, I don't have any strikes against you. <laughs> She's real good about that. Uh, informing us of that and so uh, why 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 is that important because uh, the, listen any Christians children but especially a pastor uh, get get a uh, the, the children need to not be accused of riot or unruly and uh, now sometimes folks we're, we're a little hard on pastors there's the perfect father is described in the in the gospel of Luke the prodigal son and and the and the the son still went prodigal okay and that was the perfect father. So I think sometimes, but, but did you notice in that story, the son had to leave home to get away with that stuff. You catch that detail. The son knew that he couldn't stay at home and do that stuff. Dad would get him. <laughs> that's a good dad. Okay, that, that's, a, that's a responsible dad. You can't look at every case and go, well, I can't believe... Uh, so-and-so's children are doing that. Well, no, everybody's got that in them. Everybody's got that in them. It's not necessarily always a... It's kind of like when the disciples looked at the lame man and said, uh, Jesus, which of his parents sinned that causes? And Jesus said, oh, what are you talking about? Neither one of them. Uh, it, was, it was neither. Don't go, to, don't go to judging things before you... But then there was another lame man that... Mark just talked about the other day in Sunday school that had sinned and it had caused his lameness. And Jesus told him, now go and sin no more. Don't, don't get back in. And he tells him specifically, if you get back into that, into that sin, uh, worse stuff's going to come on you. And so sometimes that can be the cause, but we're not, we don't know that. What I'm saying is, uh, now, it, it, does, it would trouble me very much if there was a pastor who was having trouble out of his children and it wasn't bothering him and he wasn't doing anything about it, that would bother me. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. then I'd go, hold on, hold on, something's not right there. That should be bothering him. It, uh, I've had pastors, I've listened to pastors uh, explain that, you know, and, and a lot of their kids, uh, I think this kid that he was talking about, his daughter, wasn't even in his home anymore. So I was, you know, I was thankful for that. But he was defending her choice of getting Christian tattoos on her body. I just, that, that's a big red flag for me. Don't, don't defend that. You, I mean, you don't have to hate her, but you don't necessarily defend that rebellious behavior either. You see what I'm saying? Uh, it's, but anyway, a pastor is supposed to have faithful children not accused of riot or unruly. Um, it says in verse 7, for a bishop must be blameless. As the steward of God, not self-willed. You know, he's got to have some self-control about him. Not soon angry. Uh, I tell you, this is... I, I've, I've struggled with my temper in my past. And I tell you, me personally, I've, I have the best control of my temper that I've ever had in my life. And I, I, I want to grow in that area, personally. I want to become just a... 
I want to become a person that's not angry at all. That you, know, you, you can do anything to me and I'm not going to get mad. Uh, where we take that too far, I've seen a lot of people as they get older, they don't get mad anymore, but they also don't care anymore. <laughs> and and the, that's, that's not a place to reach either. Uh, so I don't want to be, it says not soon angry. Uh, don't just fly off the handle. Don't, don't have knee jerk reactions. Not given to wine. Yeah, I can see where that would be important as well. Uh, no striker. Well, just every once in a while. Just every once in a while. I have to, I have to beat Johnny up a little bit and get her in line. <laughs> when we first got married, there was a rumor that, uh, and her brothers got mad at me. Her brothers got mad at me. Were we married a year? When there was this rumor that I had, I had beaten her in our front yard in Golden. And, okay, so, and, and oh, uh, I guess whoever this was was telling her mom about this. And her mom said, well, who saw it? And, and the person who was reporting it said, well, her neighbor was telling me about it. Our only neighbor was, Ann, was Miss Ann. She's like in her 80s. And uh, <laughs> she wouldn't have known this person who was reporting it, okay? She just, she wouldn't have known this person. And we're going, what is she talking about? So, uh, and, uh, but her mom's response was hilarious. She said, uh, if anything, I would think that Johnny's beating him up. <laughs> <laughs> and she never gave it a moment's thought. Uh, one of her brothers got mad, and then uh, I think her mom was, was going, are you serious? This is Jonica we're talking about. <laughs> so uh, it kind of blew. Come to find out, it was somebody else in town in Broken Bow, not even where we lived. But uh, that's, that's the way stuff can go sometimes. But um, <laughs> no striker. He's not to be a striker. Not given to filthy lucre. Not greedy, in other words. Uh, he's to be a, a lover of hospitality in verse 8. A lover of good men. He's, in other words, he's to, to enjoy good company. He's to enjoy good company. Uh, I mean, I've mentioned this many times to Johnny. You know, whenever I... Gave my life to the Lord. I lost a lot of I lost a lot of friends, <laughs> but really I gained a lot of friends, and uh, I gained a lot of the right people. Uh, that uh, you know, I'd rather run with the right the right crowd. And so they're also to be sober, which is serious minded. Uh, they're to be just, which is uh, fair, you know, and, and have some justice about them. They're to be holy, and they're to be temperate. Again, that self control right there. Verse 9, they are to hold fast the faithful word as they have been taught, uh, that they may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. See, there's false teachers coming in. And these guys have got to be able to keep that false teaching out of the church. And they've got to be able, listen, they've got to be able by sound doctrine to both exhort and convince. They're to take that stuff on. Okay, they're not to, to sugarcoat things. And, um, and, and all of that. I was, I was watching a YouTube video earlier when I was, when I was just kind of relaxing before church. And uh, it's, it's a, I, it popped up in my YouTube feed. And it, it, was, it, was, a, it was a joke. It said women's Bible studies. And, and, and it was meant to be satire. It was meant to be a joke of how, how women's Bible studies go. And this was a woman doing it. And she was just kind of, I don't know, she was, she was playing multiple roles in the, in, the, in the video. And one of them, she's just very emotional and all this stuff. And another one, she's like, oh, you go, girl, and stuff. And it was just fun. It was funny. But there was one of them sitting there, and she's serious. She's like, I thought this was supposed to be a Bible study. I thought we weren't supposed to be taking Scripture and twisting it. You know, and I was like, this is, this is pretty good. You know, it's pretty funny. Come to find out, she made another YouTube video about her testimony. She was in the New Age movement. And I haven't ever paid just a ton of attention to that stuff. I, I've heard of it, and I know some things about it, but I haven't, haven't wanted to read their books, haven't wanted to get in their stuff. But she came out of that. And, the, and she said, the way I did it was I got in my Bible. <laughs> and started actually paying attention to what the Bible said, instead of this name it and claim it, instead of this word of faith, instead of this... 
uh, a lot of this stuff that, that a, a lot of people are getting caught up in, it's false teaching. It's gainsayers. It's, uh, <clears throat> how would she, what'd she say on one of them? I'm trying to remember uh, an example. She, uh, she was talking about some of the books that she got into and how they will use a lot of the same terms we use, but they will put a different meaning on the term. Like when we say saved, or when we say the gospel, or something of like that, they have a completely different meaning. And she said, when you get really far into their teachings, believe it or not, they teach that you can become God. They go that far. Like the really deep stuff, they, they teach that you become a God, which is why you can start... Uh, she showed a book of Joel Osteen. Uh, she didn't care about naming names. She showed a book with Joel Osteen on the front of it, and the title of his book is I Am. Okay, that's a claim of deity. It's a claim of God, okay? And she said, in his book he teaches, all you have to do is start saying, I am beautiful. Or I am rich. Or I am powerful. Or I am whatever. You fill in the blank, and you will be that if you believe it. It's, and basically, you're basically trying to set yourself up to be God is what she said. And the deeper teachings of that stuff, when you really start to get in it, you're using Christian terms and you're twisting. Now, I'm just quoting her. <laughs> I'm just quoting her. She And she, uh, I saw where she had made another video about people who can't stand her on YouTube and stuff. And she's basically like, I don't care. <laughs> I'm, trying to be, I'm trying to warn people about some of this stuff. She said she was a, a young Christian when she got into that stuff and she can't, she just... She wants to warn people about it. That's one of the purposes Paul is setting up the pastors here. Okay, He's setting up the pastors by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. He says in verse 10, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses. These guys were going into churches and convincing families to break away. They were convincing families to break away and split up churches. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail on all of this because it's it's personal to a church, uh, a church in a, in, a, in a neighboring town, but their pastor was sharing some things with me. He had a family that basically joined their church and he, he knew some of their background. They have, they have a Baptist background, but it's... It's a, we call them Andersonites. If you haven't heard of Stephen Anderson, he's got a big following. He's in Arizona, I believe it is. And he's got a lot of hate. I mean, he's got a lot of hate. He hates a lot of people. He believes if you he believes homosexuals are doomed for hell. They cannot be forgiven. Um, in fact, he believes that you ought to just tell them that. Uh, he's got a, just a ton of, he's got a lot of hate. And a lot of people follow him. It's really sad to me. Uh, but this family had had that background. That's actually how they had come to know the Lord, is through the internet and through YouTube, and they had actually gotten involved in that. And so uh, this pastor friend of mine went to him and he said, look, if you start causing trouble or anything like that, you have to give me your word, you'll leave peacefully. You know, Because he wanted to minister to him. He wanted to set him straight on some doctrinal things. He wanted to try to help him. And for a while it went really good. It went really, really good. And then one day, uh, they uh, s something happened in the church, and I'm I'm totally in agreement with the pastor and his decisions, and I'm not trying to go. But they got mad, and they went about trying to split up the church. They went from family to family to family, subverting whole houses. And I'm glad the church didn't split. I'm glad that there were a few of them that were right there on the. You know, you know, just teetering. I'm glad they didn't. I'm glad that family didn't succeed. Teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, "The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies." This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. 
They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Now let me say this. Let me go back to the Andersonites because I, I don't talk about them much. Um, I believe a lot of people are probably getting genuinely born again in a lot, of the, a lot of the messages when he's preaching on salvation and things of that nature. But I'm telling you, uh, some of his stuff is pretty rotten. Okay, Some of his sermons, and so he's got a big following, um, and it's, it's alarming me. I, some, some, some of the folks in our own church have come to me before and asked me about a certain preacher on YouTube. I'll look him up, and sure enough, he's out of that Anderson stuff. And I'll tell him, well, I didn't hear him say anything wrong in his sermon. It sounded good. I'm just saying, be careful with that guy. You may, you know, if, if some red flags start to pop up, you may need to get away from him. Sure enough, a couple of weeks later, that member came to me and they said, yeah, uh, there, was a, there was a sermon that, uh, I, yeah, I could tell it wasn't biblical. And I said, okay. I said, and, and, and they, they told me, well, I'm not going to be watching that anymore. I said, okay. I said, it's probably a wise move. Probably a pretty wise move. So, I wish that wasn't the case, uh, but it's just, I don't know, it's not a very Christian way of being. When you find Paul or the disciples, when they're witnessing to people that are kind of hostile to the gospel, you don't find them railing against them. You don't find them uh, condemning people to hell or anything like that. You find them witnessing to them and trying to win them to Christ. And you find them not wanting them to be almost persuaded. You find that you find a, a gentler spirit about it. Um, I don't know. We got to be careful. Uh, some of those directions that we go in. I know that uh, Stephen Anderson himself can't stand Heartland Baptist Bible College. Because he called them out on YouTube. <laughs> Basically said they're a bunch of heretics and they're all going to hell. and Had all kinds of, really, and that happens to be a college that we support. So, uh, I, you see why you got to be careful some of the stuff you get into. Yeah. Really, uh, I, I tell people just get in your Bible. Get in your Bible, pay attention to what it's saying. Be careful listening to all this stuff out there. Uh, in chapter number 2, we're going to see the conduct of members in the church and how they ought to be. <clears throat> chapter 2, verse number 1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged or old men uh, be so sober. They're to be serious-minded. They're to be grave. That's honorable. They're to be temperate, self-controlled. They're to be sound in faith solid or uncorrupted in their faith. In, in, uh, they're to be sound in charity. That's godly love. They're to be sound in patience. This is, these are instructions for old men. Okay, It goes on, it says in verse 3, and, and aged women likewise. So everything he just said about the aged men goes for the aged women as well. So aged women are to be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, Sound in charity and sound in patience. Aged women are, are to be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. They're to teach good things. You know, we talked about that this morning, how I said over in 1 Timothy, a woman is not to teach or usurp authority over a man. See, that's the key. You don't stop right there where they're not to teach. You keep reading the rest of the verse. The rest of the verse says, not a man. It didn't say little boys. Okay? But it's saying, not a man. And there, there's reasons for that. Um, uh, but anyhow, they are to be teachers. They're to be teachers of good things. It says in verse 4 that they may teach the young women to be sober, because young women need to learn that. Jonica, Sophie, Terish, when you watch this, uh, Jace Lee. They need to learn how to have patience. Yeah. For those watching on YouTube, Keithan just said they need to learn how to have patience. No, they 
Okay, we should. All right. Uh, that they may teach the young women to be sober, uh, to love their husbands. <laughs> Brother Bosky was down here uh, uh, when we were visiting when he was down here. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pick on him for just a second. He was, he was over in Ephesians, I believe it was, and he was, he was in the passage where he said, Husbands, love your wives. And he was, he was going, Man, isn't that just like a guy? We have to be told to love our wives, but wives don't have to be told to love their husbands. Wrong! <laughs> Wrong. It says it right there. I, I got him afterwards. I was like, you know, it does tell wives they have to love their husbands. Uh, but uh, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. The fact that young women may have to be reminded they have to love their children. Now that, that's pretty surprising that, that that would be in the Bible, but that's very important. Uh, I mean, a lot of young women today will do away with their baby before it's even born. It's a, it's a sad day. Young women need to be taught to love their children. Young women in verse 5 are to be taught to be discreet, chaste, or chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. If this isn't done, the word of God will be blasphemed. It says in verse 6, young men, so he's, he's getting everybody in this, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. It says in verse 7, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, and sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort, now here we go, servants. In this day, this would have been actual slaves. Today, we would say employees. Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Don't, don't talk back. Don't run your mouth. Don't roll your eyes, kiddos, when we give you something to do. Don't, <gasps> don't huff and puff. And blow your house away, but don't uh, don't huff about doing something. Don't roll your eyes. Don't uh, don't don't run your mouth. Don't talk back. Verse ten: Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. It says in verse eleven: For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now, I want you to think about this. Right here he says, the grace of God has appeared to all men. I got way ahead of myself. Okay, here we go. <laughs> grace is entirely of God. It says the grace of God. Grace precedes and makes possible salvation. Did you know it's grace that bringeth salvation? Okay. And then we're also told that grace hath appeared to all men. It's grace that pricks their hearts. He places knowledge of His existence in all hearts. His creation reveals His existence and power. He places knowledge of His judgment in all hearts. He draws all men unto Himself. All of these are quotes from the Bible. When men spurn this grace reject his existence, according to Romans chapter 1, suppress his truth, turn to false gods and vile sins, do not even like to think of God, could care less about his judgment and refuse his drawing, they are responsible, guilty, and condemned, even if they have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. All of that is true. Because the grace of God hath appeared to all men. It has. Jot it down. It's appeared to all men. Uh, the grace of God empowers us to live holy lives too. It says in verse 12, The grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. It's the grace of God that teaches us that. It says in verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself 
a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. The grace of God goes on and, uh, how we should be res uh, how we should respond to the grace of God. Look at uh, chapter three, verse one. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. Those are people in leadership. And be government officials. To obey magistrates. To be ready to every good work. To speak evil of no man. To be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. Have you ever been foolish? I've been foolish. Disobedient. You ever been disobedient? You ever been deceived? Serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness of and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of, of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Churches today, I mean good churches that are teaching genuine salvation. Hey, Brent, Keith, take Brentley back there. Churches today that are genuinely teaching genuine salvation, right? You won't ever hear them mention works at all. You won't ever hear them explain works at all. Okay? And, and the reason for that is because people, a lot of churches have gotten into teaching work salvation. And so these churches that genuinely want people to be born again, won't, they won't say that word. It's almost like a cuss word. You know? No, don't ever mention works. He just mentioned works twice. The, the actual word works twice in response to grace. He said in chapter 2, verse 15, look at it. These things speak and, and exhort... Uh, it's not that one. Oh, it's in verse 14. Jesus gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. That's when you're saved by grace. You ought to be, after that, you ought to be zealous of good works. Uh, in verse 8, he says, this is a faithful saying of, of chapter 3. These things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God, those are saved people, might be careful to maintain good works. Remind them to do that. The key is to realize it's just it's not to keep your salvation or anything like that. It's to work because you are saved, because you love the Lord. These things are good and profitable unto men. We're also to avoid foolish questions in verse 9 and genealogies. This is one reason I'm, I, I don't get caught up in learning a lot about the New Age movement. or thing. I try to learn a little bit more to kind of just so I don't get into any of that stuff because there's so many of them books around and all that kind of thing. But uh, we're to avoid getting in arguments, spiritual arguments, uh, foolish questions, genealogies and contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. They're a waste of time. Don't get into that stuff. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject him, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. And then he has some closing remarks here. Uh, I wanted to go through this, the book of Titus tonight. And I'm so glad that the Lord didn't leave us in the dark on this stuff. I'm so glad that even though false teachers and false teachings have popped up, I'm glad the Lord laid it out here pretty clear for us, didn't He? Here's what aged men ought to do. Here's what uh, the aged women ought to do. Here's what the young men ought to do. Here's what the younger women ought to do. Uh, here's, here's how we do these things. Here's what the grace of God is doing in our lives. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful the Lord didn't leave us in the dark. I'm glad He gave us pastors uh, to lead us and to, to watch out for these things. And 
Uh, just like that whole that New Age movement. That that girl said she got saved and and uh, she didn't have. I guess I don't. I guess she wasn't in church. I guess she didn't have a pastor leading her. She said because she just started reading every book she could get her hands on, just trying to learn, and she wound up getting into that New Age stuff. And uh, I, man, I'm I, you know I was sitting there listening to her. I'm like, man, I'm glad I'd never. I'm glad that didn't happen to me. I'm glad I had a pastor. I'm glad I had you know parents that cared about me, had me in church, and had had me under a pastor. I'm glad I had parents that had me under sound doctrine. I'm glad that mattered to them. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, and and my mom and dad would talk about doctrine. My pastor would talk about sound doctrine all the time. Talk about salvation by grace. Talk about these things. Uh, churches around us were falling away from that stuff. Because I remember my pastor would talk about it. I remember uh, my parents would kind of, uh, we, I don't really think we need to go to church over there. Uh, you know, uh, we'd have a family member go in there and, uh, you know, no, let's, let's, let's just stick with our church. Let's just, I'm glad they did that kind of stuff. I'm glad we didn't ca get caught up in all those false teachings. Titus is about setting the church in order. And I tell you, it's just as relevant today as it's ever been. Uh, it was needed 2,000 years ago. It's still needed today. I'm thankful for the book of Titus. I hope you'll be thankful as well. Let's uh, close with a word of prayer tonight. Heavenly Father.